Okay, Dr. Yating, we are going to start now. So maybe you can switch on your camera as well. Camera and the mic both, yeah. Okay, so good afternoon, everybody. And today we are going to discuss about very, very interesting cases regarding to rickets, which is a common presentation. And we know most cases of rickets are related to vitamin D deficiency, but there are substantial numbers which are related to resistance to vitamin D. And these cases are associated with abnormalities in either the renal handling of the phosphorus, the acid or the calcium, or there is some problem in terms of vitamin D activation or action. Today, we're going to discuss about four very interesting diverse types of cases, which will focus upon different etiologies of refractory rickets. And I'm really pleased to be joined uh, by uh, two of our international fellows who are working with us in, uh, in our medical classes program. One is Dr. Yetin. Uh, Dr. Yating is uh, a pediatric endocrine fellow who is working in Taiwan. Dr. Yating, can you open your uh, switch on your uh, camera, please? And it's indeed a pleasure for uh, her to join with us. And we have Dr. Musa Kutti, who is actually traveling here from Ireland, and he'll also be presenting a same similar sort of a case on that. So, Dr. Yating, before we start, we can have some uh, words from you. You are muted. You are muted. Okay. Hello. Good afternoon, everyone. And thank you for having me here. Sure, sure. Okay. So uh, we'll start off with a brief introduction about rickets and why it is important and how uh, we can approach. And then it will become much easier to have those cases to discuss out from that perspective. So uh, we'll start off with this case, a three-year-old boy who presented with rickets and was given a case of vitamin D dose was given. The parents were really concerned about bone pain and a high level of alkaline phosphatase, which was found on follow-up. And calcium levels were normal and the patient was labeled quote-unquote as refractory rickets. Now, as well, we'll discuss about that. We need to understand that once you treat, there are different changes which may happen, which can cause bone pain and the ALP is a marker of bone formation and the levels may go up. So, this is not really a case of refractory rickets because once you label refractory rickets, you have to do many complicated investigations like blood gas, PTH, vitamin D, calcitriol, which is not going to help out and will cause more confusion or problem. So this was a clearly a simple case in which if we had looked for the line of healing, it was present. So this was a classical case in which we were messing up with a simple case, making it more complicated in that regard. So this was a normal response. On the contrary, we have this 14-year-old boy who presented with rickets with very early onset from around 3 to 4 years. And we can see significant lower limb abnormalities, has received huge amounts of vitamin D. There was no response as far as the radiological picture was concerned. There was no line of healing. And despite that, vitamin D was continuously given, which had unfortunately resulted in nephrocalcinosis. Now, this is a prototype case of refractory rickets in which it was found to have hypophosphatemic rickets. So we have got the two extreme scenarios, one where we are unnecessarily working up, messing up a case, and here what we are missing up a case. So this is the scenario which is there from that regards. So rickets can either be missed and missed, and this can have significant consequences. It is a common disorder, 90-95% are nutritional, but we need to identify individuals who are unlikely to respond to vitamin D because they require comprehensive evaluation and assessment from that regards. All of you can go and have a look at our website, learning.grow society, which is a learning portal providing courses about pediatric endocrinology, including fellowship and diploma programs. Uh, we do run regular activities in the form of journal clubs, postgraduate lecture series and grand lounge like this, which provide insights using case-based approaches. We have got publications in pediatric endocrinology, which are available both online as well as in a hard copy. Um, application also helps in terms of day-to-day -day management. So today, our agenda would be to focus a bit about rickets to begin with. Then we'll talk about hypophosphatemic rickets, a very interesting case by Dr. Vibha. Then Dr. Yating will be talking about the case of VDDR. Dr. Uh, Musa will also talk about a similar case which we encountered. So just to contrast the two approaches there. Then we have a case of proximal RTA by Dr. Manoj and distal RTA via Dr. Dhwani. And this will really complete the entire picture of the four major causes of refractory rickets. Now, when we talk about rickets, we are talking about two things, calcium and phosphorus. Now, both of them are important for bone formation, but the most important is actually phosphorus. 
and it's the phosphorus deficiency which is actually responsible for rickets because phosphorus causes a chondrocyte apoptosis if the phosphorus levels are low you will not have apoptosis and therefore the growth plate will grow more and you will develop rickets so rickets is essentially a problem of calcium and phosphorus and we know that the major regulator of serum calcium is actually vitamin d axis so vitamin d which is produced either under the exposure of sun or 5% from the plant sources is then activated by the liver to 25 hydroxy vitamin d which is further activated by a 1 alpha hydroxylase into calcitriol and this calcitriol then causes the effect which happens in terms of increasing absorption of calcium from 25% to 40% and if you have deficient in either vitamin d in 25 hydroxylase 125 hydro hydroxylase or if you have a problem in vitamin d receptor you will develop a, a refractory rickets there is also a inactivating pathway of 24 hydroxylase which inactivates this to a inactive form and which basically results in decreased action from that perspective phosphorus levels in the body are largely determined by how much is the urine excretion of phosphorus so major disorders of phosphopenic forms are associated with low level of serum phosphorus and a high level of urinary phosphorus which is reflected by a, a low level of tubular maximum of gfr which is tmp gfr now phosphopenic rickets needs to be differentiated from the calcopenic rickets which is basically a calcium and vitamin d problem but remember all forms of rickets are ultimately phosphopenic because if you have calcium deficiency your parathyroid hormone will go up and as soon as your parathyroid hormone goes up you will lose phosphorus in the urine so everybody with rickets should have a low phosphorus and that's a important distinguishing point if your phosphorus is high with rickets there are only two conditions you are thinking of renal failure or a pseudo hypoparathyroidism so phosphorus deficiency is common but if it is because of secondary hyperparathyroidism then you will have the calcopenic rickets while if it's because of a primary tubular pathology your pth will not be high you will basically have a phosphopenic form of rickets so phosphopenic rickets could be part of a generalized tubular dysfunction like fankeny syndrome or a specific problem in which the phosphorus losing substances are more in the body which is the phosphatonins typically fgf23 which is acting via the hypophosphatemic rickets in this condition you will not only have phosphorus deficiency but also the increase in calcitriol does not happen anybody whose phosphorus goes down should have a high calcitriol so here the fgf23 not only causes phosphorus excretion it also causes inhibition of 1 alpha hydroxylase so these individuals you need to treat with both calcitriol as well as phosphorus in that regards there is one exception in which there is a problem of the sodium phosphate pathway wherein you will have hypophosphatemia with high calcitriol and this is going to cause you hypercalciuria so if you have hypophosphatemic rickets always measure urinary calcium before you start calcitriol because you may have that np2 variant which may cause nephrocalcinosis will develop quickly so this form of rickets typically presents late predominantly with lower limb abnormalities and otherwise the child looks normal he is not sick from that perspective while the calcopenic rickets can start right from decreased exposure to sunlight decreased calcium intake a chronic liver disease with malabsorption use of anti epileptic drugs which increase inactivation of vitamin d abnormalities in the kidney functions like chronic kidney disease decreased production of calcitriol which is vitamin d dependent rickets and you will have a early onset rickets in a sick child who develops tetany and hyperparathyroidism so if you want to distinguish between calcopenic and phosphopenic rickets having hypocalcemia having hyperparathyroidism excludes a primary phosphopenic pathology this is an important thing to remember so pth becomes the second very important investigation when we talk about evaluation of rickets there is also a third group of disorders which is because of tubular abnormalities largely because of metabolic acidosis now these disorders are not really affecting the vitamin d to a great extent the acidosis itself is causing abnormalities in the bone 
So these disorders will present to us with failure to thrive, with polyuria, with nephrocalcinosis, so distal and proximal RTA. Now remember, proximal RTA presents earlier with much lower level of phosphorus. You will have urinary glucose or urinary amino acid urea. The severity of acidosis will be milder in proximal RTA. So you may miss actually these cases. Distal RTA presents a bit later, but the severity of acidosis is much more. You may have hypokalemia. You will develop nephrocalcinosis. And if you don't treat early, you will develop pathological fractures, very, very fragile bone. So later onset, 6 to 10 years of age, significant failure to thrive, hypokalemia, neck flop, fractures. Think of a distal RTA. First two to three years of life, very low phosphorus levels, urinary glucosuria, start thinking of a proximal RTA from that perspective. So now, based upon that perspective, we can classify rickets into deficiency, which is both calcium and vitamin D, in which you can look at the therapeutic response to rickets. Then it may be refractory, which can be calcioepenic because of VDDR1 and 2, renal failure and malabsorption, which is early onset hyperparathyroidism and hypocalcemia. You can have acidosis because of proximal or distal RTA with polyuria, failure to thrive. And if it's distal RTA, you will develop nephrocalcinosis. And finally, you will have the phosphopenic form in which you have hypophosphatemic rickets, Fanconi's disorder or malabsorption associated with late onset lower limb abnormalities with normal calcium and PTH. So if you now remember just two things, phosphorus, calcium, PTH. These three will classify all your forms of rickets and we'll use it for further evaluation. Now the big question is, when you're facing a child with rickets is, is it really rickets? If it's rickets, is it refractory rickets or not? And then finally, what is the cause? So rickets, of course, is a radiological diagnosis, but clinical parameters can give you a clue. So you can have a genuvalgum, genuvarum, and windswept deformity. Now remember, genuvarum may actually be a normal phenomena in infants. So if you have a windswept deformity or a genuvalgum, that is much more significant. But remember, one to two years, you can have some form of bony which may happen. And of course, we know about the cupping, fraying, and splaying. All those are characteristic. The next question is, is it refractory or not? The answer, of course, is that you should give a therapeutic trial of vitamin D and wait for that. So these are the guidelines by the Indian Academy of Pediatrics, which are similar to the consensus statement by the global team. They talk about 60,000 international units fortnightly for five doses beyond 12 months or 3,000 international units daily for 12 weeks. So you have to wait for three months to get the response and then you will decide whether it's refractory or not in that regards. Now remember, when you give vitamin D, you will cause increased absorption of calcium and phosphorus. And this calcium and phosphorus will go into the bone to cause deposition and mineralization of the bone. Now, in this scenario, if you are deficient in calcium and you are not giving calcium, you may develop what is known as hungry bone syndrome or there may be bone pain. So, bone pain may be a normal phenomena which may happen. So, always give calcium with vitamin D. So, this is common. The second thing to remember is that when you are actually giving calcium and phosphorus, the overall turnover of bone will become more. Your osteoblast will act more, your osteoclast will act more, and osteoblast will produce alkaline phosphatase. So alkaline phosphatase levels may rise during the initial phase of treatment. This is basically a marker of a response. It's not a marker of refractory rickets. You have to be cautious about in that regards. And rise in ALP may happen. So the gold standard for response is the line of healing. That is what you need to look at in that regards. So refractory rickets, you need to show that there is rickets, both clinical as well as radiological, and you have given adequate calcium and vitamin D for 12 weeks, there is no line of healing. This is refractory rickets to you. But remember, in certain scenarios, there may be confusion, which may cause diagnosis of refractory rickets, particularly, as I said, high levels of alkaline phosphatase hypocalcemia and bone pain after treatment, which does not mean that you have rickets. It basically means that this is a normal nutritional rickets, which is responding. Wait and watch for more time. 
Other things which may cause rickets are like skeletal dysplasia, pseudo hypoparathyroidism, or fluorosis, which may look like rickets. And of course, because they are not rickets, they will not respond to vitamin D, and you may label them as a significant case of a pathophysiological cause. One condition important is hypophosphatasia, and this is characterized via a absolutely low level of alkaline phosphatase. So I've talked about calcium, phosphorus, PTH. The fourth player is alkaline phosphatase. So if your alkaline phosphatase is high, that is a normal response. If ALP is normal, you may be dealing with RTA, which is a low bone turnover. If it's very low, think of hypophosphatase. So alkaline phosphatase is very important. But many times, <clears throat> first time you are seeing the child, you may think, okay, this is something important. I want to exclude a refractory rickets. So if there is polyuria, fractures, normal nutritional rickets does not cause fractures. So if there is a fracture in a child, significant failure to thrive, you think of refractory rickets. So we've now known that this child had a refractory rickets, a good dose of vitamin D and calcium was given, but still he is not responding. So what's the cause? So from here, we will need to understand what are the causes. So this is from my publication long time ago. And what we see the four major causes was distal RTA, proximal RTA, VDDR, and hypophosphatemic rickets. And we'll be presenting all four of them in the discussion today. If you go by the Western textbooks, they talk about distal RTA not being a cause of rickets. The reason is if you pick them up at an early stage, they will not develop rickets. But if you delay the diagnosis, like often happens in that regards, you would have a delayed diagnosis and that will cause a significant problem from that perspective. So you need to be cautious about in that perspective to evaluate and assess from that regards. So always take a history of if there is any tetany or any features like that, you can think of a calciopenic rickets. If there is polyuria, it indicates renal tubular acidosis. If there is a primary lower limb abnormality, this is more like a phosphopenic rickets. On examination, if there is anemia, this could be celiac disease or a chronic kidney disease. If there is alopecia, particularly alopecia totalis, this could be a variant of vitamin D dependent rickets type 2, particularly the ligand binding domain causes this. Look for the eyes for the crystals, and this could be an indicator of cystinosis, uh, hemangiomas, and hemangiomas are important because they may secrete FGF23, and if you remove those tumors, your rickets will improve. That will be an important thing. And of course, if there is mottling of teeth, think of fluorosis as a possibility. Now, if you look at clinical parameter that we have mentioned here, the most important, of course, is calcium. Calcium will, of course, be very low in VDDR. Phosphorus will be low in everybody. ALP will be higher in most, but not that high in distal RTA. So basic parameters will help you out in that regards and nephrocalcinosis of course will give you a direct picture towards the diagnosis of a distal RTA. Important thing to remember is that amino acid urea which is a marker of a proximal tubular dysfunction may also happen in distal RTA because of secondary hyperparathyroidism. So this is the paper that we published there subsequently. So if we now look at the primary causes I've mentioned those four causes along with renal failure and PHP so six causes the most important is phosphorus. If your phosphorus is high, it's renal failure or pseudo hypoparathyroidism. Then calcium, if it is low, it excludes hypophosphatemic rickets. A normal calcium and a normal PTH suggest the possibility of a hypophosphatemic rickets. So generally, everybody who has rickets should have a low phosphorus and a high PTH. If your PTH is normal and phosphorus is low, think of a hypophosphatemic rickets. And of course, urinary calcium, if it's high, it's more like a renal tubular acidosis and acidosis will also give you a picture. So most important thing is phosphorus. Second is PTH. And then of course, ALP and urinary calcium will give you a clue. So back around 17, 18 years ago, we gave an algorithm at that time based upon our results. Results are pretty similar. So this is our current algorithm. So first, of course, is to look for response of vitamin D, maybe wait up to a period of approximately three months. If there is response, it's a deficiency rickets. If there is no response, look at phosphorus. If phosphorus is low, you can have RTA, you can have VDDR, and you can have hypophosphatemic rickets. So look for blood gas. If it shows acidosis, that is renal tubular acidosis, you classify using urinary pH, 
urinary carbon dioxide to blood carbon dioxide difference you can use this fraction excretion of bicarb into proximal or distal artery we'll talk about this a bit later if the blood gas is normal and your calcium in pth is also normal this is hypophosphatemic rickets while if you have hypocalcemia you have vddr which you can classify using calcitriol level low level suggest vddr1 and high level suggest vddr2 remember calcitriol should be done only when needed if you do calcitriol level in vitamin e deficiency the level may be low normal or even high so it's not a very very good marker because it is affected by pth it's substrate independence these are the all problems which happens with calcitriol now on the other hand if your phosphorus is high only two diagnoses are there if creatinine is high this is renal failure if creatinine is normal this is pseudo hypoparathyroidism so of course look at response to vitamin d look at phosphorus low phosphorus look at blood gas if blood gas is normal calcium and pth if phosphorus is high look at creatinine so this is how you establish the diagnosis we have a specific approach pathways which are dedicated to rickets in our application you can use them to identify the cause of refractory rickets easily from that regard so now we'll move forward towards the presentations first approach is by dr vibha who will be talking about a very interesting case of hypophosphatemic rickets uh, thank you sir <clears throat> Good afternoon, everyone. So we have this 15-year-old boy who was born of non-consensual marriage, and he presented to our OPD with a complaint of not gaining height and weight since two years of age. And when we inquired further, his father told us that he was asymptomatic till two years of age. One, his parents noted that he was not thriving well. He was uh, uh, very short and his weight was very less according to uh, as compared to his uh, cousins then uh, he told us that he started walking at around one and one and a half years of age uh, then uh, they noticed that uh, he gradually developed bowing of legs and protrusion of forehead but there was no widening of wrist and child frequently complained of lower limb which lead to difficulty in walking the child looks absolutely normal. He was not sick looking at that time. And he also gave the history that his mother has also short stature and similar kind of lower limb deformity present. At the age of three to four years, the child developed a dental caries very frequently. So they went to the doctors for the dental extraction very frequently. And there was no history of any uh, muscle spasm, any abnormal twisting of the hands. There was no history of any seizure, motor developmental delay, delayed dentition. And uh, uh, they did not give any history of polyuria, pathological fractures, no history of jaundice, diarrhea, greasy stools, or clay clad stools. And uh, he hasn't taken any anti convulsions. So, Uh, when we asked about the treatment history, like uh, for this bowing of legs, they told us that they have taken a lot of treatments for this bowing of legs in the form of syrup calcium and vitamin D for at least one year of, for at least duration of one year. But they, uh, they did not get any improvement instead of taking uh, treatment for one year. Lot of investigations were done. Before the investigation, so what do you think about this case? And what is the most likely diagnosis in the product? So, uh, as we have discussed, like uh, he was absolutely normal till two years of age. So, if we go, and uh, he developed uh, deformities when we started walking, and it uh, mainly developed the lower limb. So, it is so, a later onset uh, yes, sir. and uh, predominantly affecting the lower, lower limbs. limbs. So, could it be VDDR? Sir, uh, VDDR. Uh, um, VDDR is a calcopenic uh, rickets and it it is it has the earlier onset. So, so generally speaking, it is unlikely to have this. Very thing. clearly mentioned, there is no seizure. There is no, no seizure. Yes, sir. So VDDR becomes very unlikely. If you have no seizures, features like cramps, cramps and muscle time, pain, yes, motor sir. delay, all those things will give you a clue of calcium yes, deficiency. And that is not there. So you look. Say, mm -hmm. What about RTA? Do you think this could be RTA? Sir, RTA at this age. Um, 
uh, definitely RTA. proximal RTA at the they don't give any history of polyuria which we frequently as in a patient uh, the proximal RTA uh, there is no history the failure of much more, more failure to thrive, failure to thrive as well. RTA yeah at this stage. So, so RTA is nearly out, out you know, of hypophosphatemic it could so it could be because uh, they have they have given significant history that the mother has also the similar complaint so okay. uh, if uh, this is a positive point towards the hypophosphatemic so sort of so it is uh, most common is the x-link dominant so it could be so the most common one is x-link dominant so. and because if it is x-link dominant mothers may also have similar, have similar so if they are mild milder symptoms, symptoms she would have Yes, so you're thinking of hypophosphatemic rickets from harm. Yes, sir. Carry on. And uh, they showed us some previous records which showed that the uh, X-ray wrist showed some cupping and fraying, and the blood investigation showed like uh, calcium was absolutely normal, and phosphorus was on the lower side, and ALP was high, and vitamin D was so slightly normal. This time? So this time he has taken treatment. Because it's very important to remember that the hmm. phosphorus usually in hypophosphatemic rickets is around 1.52. Yes, so 3.3 is very difficult to achieve. Hmm. Because as soon as you give phosphorus, what will happen to PTH? So PTH will increase. PTH will increase hmm. and it cause wash away, of wash the, away phosphorus. the phosphorus. So seven phosphorus you take immediately will be washed off in the urine. So this is suggestive definitely of an active rickets active. with a lowish level of phosphorus. Oh, phosphorus. Carry on. So uh, they uh, consulted so many doctors and uh, there was no significant natal and the postnatal history. There was no history of neonatal seizures and he was developmentally normal. He came so late at the age of 15 years. So we have the anthropometry of uh, this boy at 15 years of age. Uh, his both, uh, as we can see in the chart, both height and weight is affected. It is minus uh, less uh, three standard deviation, which is showing the nutrition pattern of growth failure. And uh, this uh, he's uh, and now uh, going to the examination. Vitals was stable in the general examination. There was no failure, uh, no sparse hair, all the alopecia. There were dental caries and some teeth were mis missing due to the extraction. Definitely, so the dental caries uh, uh, is important and it is most com most commonly present in the hypophosphatine cricket. So, so fluorosis can be the other possibility in which you can have a lot of dental issues which are there. But yes, but so the key pointers, so yeah. other pointers of hypophosphatine crickets are, of course, we talked about late onset, lower limb involvement, yes, sir. Mother, yes, sir. the mother. The other important thing is that these dental abscesses, Absolutely. dental extraction, enthesitis, which yes, is a problem in the tendons, tendons, all of those things are more suggestive of hypothesis against the other way problem. And still at the age of 15 years, he had mild genuverum. And in the systemic examination, there was no hepatosplenomegaly. And uh, um, we again do the, uh, run some investigations. And uh, as we can see, the Calcium was normal. The phosphorus uh, was on the lower side. It was 2.9. And the VBG, the blood gas was normal. There was no acidosis or alkalosis. The PT, PTH was also on the normal side. There was no uh, hypercalciuria as urine uh, spot creatinine, calcium to creatinine ratio was less than 0.25. And the vitamin D was also in the normal range. So if you go on there, what we are seeing here is that your phosphorus level is low. low. Now, from our algorithm, we talk about phosphorus being low. We say you go for a blood gas, blood gas. as a renal tubular acidosis. Yes. So that would be the one possibility to look at. Now, have you done a urinary phosphorus or a TMP GFR? No, sir. Why? Do you think that's very important? No, sir. Definitely. Why? Because, uh, sorry. TMP refer is just. So we I don't get the exact factor. Estimation. Most people discuss that okay, you should do a TMP GFR and require the urinary excretion and all those things. But I'll give you a basic message. The major determinant of your serum phosphorus is how much you are losing in urine. Mm -hmm. You will never be deficient in phosphorus because you always eat everything you eat has got phosphorus. Mm -hmm. So nobody is going to become phosphorus deficient because mm -hmm. of decrease intake. Mm -hmm. It has to be increasing. 
So if your phosphorus is low, you expect your TMP GFR to be low. low. Now, if you look at TMP GFR, tubular maximum, there are two ways to calculate. Yes, One sir. is a nomogram. nomogram. The other there is a formula. So that formula starts with plasma phosphorus, phosphorus minus, minus phosphorus, phosphorus, phosphorus and other things, which means it will always be below your plasma mm -hmm. phosphorus. Yes. So if your plasma phosphorus is low, the TMP GFR be. is not going to help out. So that's why we have hmm. not done in this classical case, we did not do that. PTH is very important. So PTH was normal, normal, which is an important factor. Calcium is normal. Yes, and sir. assuming that the blood gas is normal, if you go by our algorithm, this is classically going into hypophosphorus. And in the USG uh, KUB, there it showed no nephrocalcinosis. So if we conclude the case, we had a 15-year-old boy. Uh, with short stature and who has lower limb deformity and uh, there is a significant maternal history with a similar complaint and who has dental infections also. So, and there was no response to the calcium in the vitamin D treatment. So, if we make a differential diagnosis, the first differential diagnosis that is, that is absolutely the hypophosphatemic rickets. But if we go further, we can think of the vitamin D resistant rickets, but this is very much unlikely because uh, the onset is later in this case and uh, renal tubular acidosis there is no hypocalcemia. hypocalcemia even if there is no hypocalcemia there is no hyperparathyroidism which means there is right. no deficiency of calcium anymore so that makes it less likely and the renal tubular acidosis also there is uh, no polyuria there is no acidosis found in the uh, blood gas and the ciliate disease, it could be the possibility due to the malabsorption, it could create a similar picture, but the TTG was normal in this case. And if we combine it with our blood investigations, our final diagnosis was hypophosphatemic reticates. And let's see the treatment, how we treat this child. Our main aim, in, our main aim was to treat, uh, to normalize the serum phosphorus, to increase the bone mineralization, to improve the rickets, and to increase the bone grip. And uh, to increase the serum phosphorus level, bone mineralization, and improve rickets, we gave serum oral phos we gave oral phosphorus with a dose of 50 milligram per kg per day. Uh, it uh, at first comes in a sachet form with the one sachet is equals to 500 gram, 500 milligram. And uh, we give calcitriol also with a dose of 30 nanogram per kg per day. That is a 0.25 microgram TDS. And as he was not gaining height, his father has main concern regarding the height. So we also started the growth hammer in this case with a dose of 35 nan microgram per kg he per day. On oral phosphorus and vitamin D for quite some time, yes. with which his, with, uh, other parameters are good, but his growth is not there. So that's why we are considering growth hormone. Growth hormone. We'll talk about how growth hormone will be additionally beneficial yes. in this setting. Uh, so let's uh, see what the growth. Uh, let's see about the monitoring. We did. Uh, we did three monthly monitoring in this child, and we see that the uh, serum phosphorus was normal. And the, this uh, our main aim was to keep the serum phosphorus to the low normal level because if we increase the serum phosphorus uh, to the normal or the high normal level, it will increase. It will cause the hyperparathyroidism in this case. And, and very importantly, you have to maintain good calcitriol. Talk about that because if your calcitriol is low, you will have higher phosphorus. phosphorus. Calcium will come, will come down, down and hyperparathyroidism. Yes, hyperparathyroidism will further worsen your phosphorus. So that's why you have to have very good balance between calcitriol and phosphorus. And uh, as we can see, if we have a uh, uh, low calcium, we have to increase the dose of uh, calcitriol and reduce the dose of phosphorus. And uh, if there is a uh, in increase the PTH level, we have to increase the dose of calcitriol and reduce the dose of oral phosphorus. And our aim, we should keep the ALP level in the high normal range. Uh, but if it is uh, uh, in the lower, we have to increase the phosphor dose. And um, it is there is a hypercalciuria. We have to decrease the dose of the calcitriol and increase, and we, we can add thiazide, but uh, there was no hypercalciuria in this case. So there was, we didn't add any thiazide in this case. And uh, the complication that we could face in this uh, child were, could be secondary hyperparathyroidism, nephrocalcinosis, and uh, but not the growth failure as we are treating uh, uh, growth in this child with the growth failure, grow, with the growth hormone. Now, some words about the growth hormone therapy, like uh, 
uh, it is required when the conventional therapy like uh, the oral phosphorus and calcitriol is alone fails to normalize the growth. And uh, what does it do? It increases the renal tubular phosphate reabsorption and it stimulates 1 alpha hydroxylation of 25 uh, uh, vitamin D. And there is a study which clearly shows the effect of uh, growth hormone in children with excellent hypophosphatemia. They have used the very high dose, that is the 80 microgram per kg per day. Uh, we can use the dose of 35 to 80 microgram per kg per day, that is the pharmacological dose of the growth hormone uh, in the uh, this hypophosphatemic crickets. And they have monitored uh, this for three monthly. And what they have seen, the increase in the high, uh, Z score in the height that has increased with the growth hormone therapy. And there was improvement in the TMP, that is the, that Sir was talking about, the tubular reabsorption of the phosphate. And they have also seen the uh, serum phosphate level has also improved with the administration of the growth hormone. So there is a clearly uh, clear cut benefit of the uh, this uh, growth hormone How therapy. So uh, I forget to mention it, sorry. So there is a clear cut uh, role of the growth hormone therapy, additional uh, benefit uh, of growth hormone therapy in the hypophosphatemic uh, rickets. Now there are some words uh, of the novel therapy of the borisumab, and uh, it is an anti FGF23 monoclonal antibody. And it, it is, uh, what does it do? It increases the tubular phosphate reabsorption and it increases the one alpha hydroxylate expression. And it is required and indicated only when, when there is a excellent refractory cases that is refracted to the conventional treatment and the severe complicated forms like those who have a dental abscess, secondary hyperparathyroidism. Now, the major issue that this is actually a more uh, treatment of choice. Right. This is we are actually correcting the path of the Right, sir. So, and it is becoming more available in many of the countries like UK, US, and Canada. This has become the standard. Stand. So new patients who are diagnosed with hypoxidemic treatment should be started on this. Okay. Old patients, they sometimes are continuing the old therapy. Okay. The biggest advantage of this is that because you are actually correcting the primary pathology, mm -hmm. you don't have to give phosphorus from yes, oxygen, you don't have to give calcium, calcium from that or the right. secondary hyperparathyroidism, all the problems of nephrocalcinosis, nephro temporary problems will be sorted Sorted out by using the chloroquine. This yes, is something which is already being used in the Western yes, countries, not available here, but it's very expensive, but this is going to be the way forward. And the dose required is 0.8 milligram per kg, twice weekly subcutaneous, and the target phosphorus uh, to be achieved is 1.2 millimole per liter, and the vitamin D, it should be between 35 to 50 and nanograms. You won't be able to get normal, normal phosphorus, phosphorus there, yes, sir. without having hyperparathyroidism. And we have to stop the vitamin D and phosphorus uh, one week before uh, starting the borisumab that. Thank you. So I think this was a very good case highlighting how uh, hypophosphatemic clickets despite good control may have growth issues and we need to work out from that perspective uh, important from that regard. So just to summarize hypophosphatemic clickets is basically because of an increased production of phosphatonin most important of which is FGF23. Phosphatonin has two actions increasing the phosphorus excretion and inhibiting 125. So to correct that, you have to basically give phosphorus as Vibha said, 30 to 50 milligram per kg per day. You also have to give calcitriol around 30 to 60 nanogram per kg per day. So both of them have to be given together. The problem is that if you have a high phosphorus, the PTH will suddenly go up and you will have a hyperparathyroidism that will push off your phosphorus again. So you have to make a balance. Don't give too high phosphorus and don't give too less calcitriol. So both of them have to be balanced from that perspective. So hyperparathyroidism may happen, which you have to worry about. You can also use, some patients have developed tertiary hyperparathyroidism also. So to prevent that, you can use a calcium mimetic like sinacalcet also in certain scenario. And as we discussed, there is possibly a role of burusumab, which will really take care of a lot of these problems and hypercalciuria, nephrocalcinosis will not happen, which will be avoided. So you may have to give thiazide from that perspective. So there are a lot of other options which are coming up for management in that perspective, and especially with borosumab, you don't need to give calcitriol, you don't need to give phosphorus, so that's a more physiological regimen from that regards. I also talked about the variant, the NP22 problems, and therefore in that session, 
you are that scenario you will develop hypercalciuria so before you diagnose somebody with uh, hypophosphatemic rickets always look at urinary calcium and that becomes important from that regards so now we'll move on to the second presentation and i am uh, really uh, pleased uh, to uh, have dr yating who is a pediatric endocrine fellow at uh, taiwan dr yating uh, has been very enthusiastic and she discussed this very interesting case of vddr so i'll ask her to please share and start the presentation dr yating uh thank you sir and uh, I yeah it's visible you can continue yeah you can continue please yes uh okay and good afternoon everyone and and is my volume okay there yeah absolutely fine yeah you are audible and, and i'm gonna present a vitamin d dependent rickett case and this is a one year 10 months old baby girl and she came to my clinic for short stature and poor motor development and she's unable to stand long and walk only for a few steps and from her growth chart right, right side, uh, we can tell that she has poor growth velocity since four months old. And meanwhile, uh, her head circumference enlarged dramatically. And she has enough uh, formula feeding and sun exposure. And uh, there's no family history of rickets or bone disorder of his uh, family members. And as for the physical examination, there's uh, obvious frontal bulging and widening wrist. Also, she has a rachitic rosary, white knee and uh, bow leg and delayed dentition. And the uh, further image showed rachitic rosary. And uh, um, metaphyseal capping and uh, favoring for many places. Her first lab data showed low calcium level, 6.6, .6, and low phosphate level, 3.2, and a high uh, intact PDH level, 379, and a high alkaline phosphate level. Her urinary calcium excretion is normal, and the fraction excretion of phosphate is relatively high, 9.8%. And uh, her um, renal function, liver function, and uh, vein blood gas all within normal limit. So from this chart, at this table, she fits vitamin D deficiency or vitamin D dependent rickid. But uh, her total vitamin D level is 42, it's normal. So exclude the diagnosis of vitamin D, vitamin D deficiency. So from the, this diagnosis, vitamin D dependent rickid, I started the treatment. She, re, she started calcium trial 0.5 microgram per day use, along with the elementary calcium 40 uh, milligram per kilo per day. And after that, her PT, IPTH and uh, alkaline, alkaline phosphate level are both still very high. Until I raised the calcium trial dose to 1.75 microgram per day, then there's a dramatic improvement. And from the clinical view, she has catch up growth since medication in these two and a half months. Also, she can walk fast now, which is a big improvement after the treatment. And uh, less constipation noted as well. As for the image study, uh, we can tell the fairing and capping pattern of the previous um, wrist get much smoother. And the same for the tibia and femur metaphysis. And in this case, we had completed the uh, whole axon sequencing and singer sequencing of the patient and her parents. The result showed a compound heterozygous mutation for CYP27B1 gene. Um, that means in this 
patient, there are two different mutations locating at two recessive alleles. And those two mutations are both for the same CYP27B1 gene. And this means a uh, uh, compound heterozygote. heterozygote. And one of the two mutation genes is the duplication of coding sequencing 19, uh, 13192135 duplication. And this one is confirmed to be a maternal origin frame shift mutation. Uh, and the other one is coding sequence 1358 G2A, uh, a paternal mutation. Okay. And the first frame shift uh, first frame shift uh, mutation is confirmed to be a pathogenic mutation according to ACMG classification guideline. And it uh, the prevalence in Taiwan is one out of one point three out of one thousand percent uh, prevalence. And uh, the other one due to a mutation uh, is a missense variant. And it is not having, it hasn't appeared in uh, Taiwan's population, but it is a uh, likely pathogenic mutation according to ACMG classification guideline. However, the whole picture is compatible to the compound heterozygous mutation pattern for uh, vitamin D dependent red kit type one. And that is my uh, um, case. I think uh, that's a very, very interesting case that uh, you've presented. And I think two big messages which come out of it is that if you have a very early onset rickets, especially if there is hypocalcemia, you should think of VDDR as a strong possibility. Now, the other message which came from your case also is the dosing of the vitamin D and calcitriol. So, uh, why do you think they require higher doses in the beginning? Uh, I think in, uh, we need a supra physiologic dose because the um, the bone turnover rate is very high initially. Yeah. So, only after the stabilization, we can tapping down the dose. So I think it's exactly as when we are treating a nutritional rickets, we are talking about 3000 international units per day, while normal dose may be 400 or 600 or something like that. So you need five to 10 times the dose. So same is true for BDDR as well. So initially we have to give a high dose and then you can come down on that. So I think that's what very beautifully you showed that as soon as the doses were upped, you had a good decline. And now I think after some time, once bones are healed, you can go back to a more physiological dose which is there from that perspective. So this was a very uh, interesting case and classically uh, the, the diagnosis has been made on that. Uh, uh, any other issues you like to raise on this case, Dr. Yating? Um, um, I have some question about the prognosis of this case. So I, 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 um, I searched the, I think a proper study from a 2011, uh, paper from Canada, yeah. and uh, this this study report a twenty five VDDR patients, mm -hmm. and the uh, first um, a conclusion is that it is possible to achieve a normal adult height if the patient has a, a good in good compliance. So th in this study, they group they put um, all the patients into three groups. And in the first groups, and they received um, calcitriol in infancy. And we can tell that in the last, they achieved all um, normal adult height comparing to the third group. The third group, they only received uh, calcitriol um, after the pubertal spurt and the height in the last is much shorter than the group one, yeah. So I think I can tell the parents it is possible to have a normal height in the last if you they have a good compliance and follow up. Yes, thank you. I think that's a very good point and this will be highlighted by Dr. Musa in the other case, which is absolutely like a phenocopy of this one. 
and in which the diagnosis was a bit late and the child had become really short so i think thanks a lot dr yating for this wonderful uh, discussion and uh, we will uh, keep you on loop if there is any question from the audience we will be uh, also posting that meanwhile we'll continue our discussion and uh, the next case uh, is also a very similar case of uh, vitamin d dependent rickets which uh, dr musa kutti will be presenting dr musa is a senior pediatrician from ireland who is uh, part of our team and he will be he is here for a few days to uh, you know on an observer visit here so it's a pleasure and honor to invite dr musa to present about this case about uh, refractory rickets again quite similar to what dr yating had presented uh, uh, just now so this will just give a different perspective of a later uh, treatment as to what may happen in that regard so dr musa please good afternoon everybody first of all i thank dr anurag and his team to give me this opportunity to present this case um i uh, while my observation here in the clinic i have an opportunity to see this case uh, in the clinic that's why i am honored to present that case to you this one year um, i'm just going through the, the this child initially presented to the clinic a few uh, two three years back at the time the child was one year five month old he was boy he has a history of regression of motor milestones and irritability he attained normal milestones up until 10 month, uh, 10 months of age he has no history of polyuria polydipsia diarrhea or any pica his birth weight was 3 kg when, uh, and uh, his uh, three elder sisters they are all healthy he born out of non consanguineous parents no history of stillbirth or in any spontaneous abortions he was admitted twice to the hospital previously with uh, dehydration apart from that he was he has no hospitalizations on examination at that time his weight was only 7.89 kg and his length was 71 centimeters his head circumference is 47 centimeters he's grossly um, retarded at that stage his uh, he cries while moving of, of his limbs he has severe hypotonia he has rickettic rosary and protuberant abdomen and he had hepatos he has no hepatosplenomegaly or no heart murmurs so he was seen initially by the local pediatrician and he tried with uh, uh, calciferol uh, he was under the impression that this vitamin d deficiency that's the right thing what to do initially and in uh, any case it, uh, try with calciferol seven sachet but he was showing no improvement that's the reason why he was referred to dr anurag's clinic um, at that stage he had investigations further which uh, on 2nd of uh, the 20th of february 2019 was the first time he was in the clinic he had initial investigations including sodium potassium the calcium was uh, low initially uh, and his hemoglobin was 9.8 border borderline his uh, creatinine was normal as mentioned that initial workup uh, creatinine blood gas that would be you know in a case of refractory curse because it was not responding to the in the, to the routine um, in, uh, treatment and uh, at that time his pth was high 5.518 uh, 25 hydroxylase was high so that clearly shows that doc, just like dr yating's case he, here also the same way I, the 25 hydroxylase was high the another thing what we noticed at that time was 125 hydroxylase was high but finally on questioning that the child had some calcitrol initially at that uh, at the time when he was present to the local pediatrician that, this was a big catch because because of this calcitrol we were thinking that this will be more like a vitamin d dependent the, rickets type 2 or a resistant form but uh, i think this is something important it's a message for us also to have a very important history on that and this full blood count ttg thyroid test magnesium liver function they're all normal so 
they did the x-ray at that time which clearly shows cupping fraying and splaying the widening of the uh, the wrist uh, that can be clearly noted in the uh, wrist left wrist x-ray and his uh, hip x-ray shows uh, dysplastic hip and also the same thing the metaphysis of the femur is also we can clearly see the markers of uh, rickets at that stage now further work was done and uh, which was on 29th of june where phosphate was 2.5 was low side but calcium was higher 9.16 alkaline phosphate is still high and pth was 5, 518 is renal blood gas renal profile they are all normal so as i mentioned uh, initial impression was vitamin d deficient uh, dependent rickets type 2 initially because of the calcitriol was high but later on when even with a normal dose of vitamin d calcitriol calcium supplements the child had good response and the repeat x-ray showed clear line improvement and clear um, uh, resolution of the rickets so, so that's typically will require much much higher, higher dose, dose, yeah. give 10 times 100 times the dose, dose as well. that will be made up of 15 that why is he responding so well yeah. and of course the concern about height is still there yeah so very short so that he might need a more work for that but the resolution of the rickets made good improvement so finally just like dr ET's case this case also turned turned out to be vitamin d dependent rickets type 1 because here, this child also had the genetic test done, which clearly showed that it's an autosomal recessive, um, um, hydros, uh, 125 hydroxylase deficiency uh, was clearly seen in this child. And these are all the investigations, uh, chronological, uh, which I have just noticed in, uh, during my observation in this clinic. So thank you very much for thank you Dr. for the interesting case and uh, thanks a lot. Yeah. So we'll now discuss about uh, two cases of phosphorus and calcium. We now move towards the other domain about the acid and how acid can make a difference. So this is the case again. Dr. Manoj is presenting a very interesting case. So please uh, start. With that. Good afternoon to all. So now previously we have seen the two uh, three cases uh, where phosphorus and vitamin D was the uh, uh, was the culprit. Now we will move towards the another entity where um, acidosis is uh, creating a, a rickets like a picture. So if I start with my case, an eight year old male child birth by fourth uh, fourth by birth order and birth of the non consecutive marriage, he has presented with the fractures before four months due to the tribal trauma. That was the initial presentation and child was not able to walk and stand due to, uh, due to severe bone pain. And this complaint has started since two to three years of duration. And child has taken tons of vitamin D and calcium supplements for the two years. And there was an inadequate response to this vitamin uh, D and calcium supplements. And child has typical history that not gaining weight and height since three to four years. Uh, on the examination, we have in this uh, um, x-rays, we are clearly seeing that a patient have a severe generalized osteopenia, pencil thin cortex like a picture, the whole bone was affected. Uh, uh, typical uh, rickets cell find like a cupping, playing, uh, praying and spray or spraying was there. Hild fracture was there, it was um, on, the, um, on the lower limb. And there was the loser zone, which is a transverse line, which is a pseudo milk line, which which, uh, which is present in, in this bone. So it is suggestive of um, uh, some uh, severe patho underlying pathology. So if we conclude these two slides, then we are dealing with some severe pathology because patient had a fracture. So it is a, a pathological factor with the refractory rickets because child has taken uh, two years of vitamin D and calcium. And if you have this part of a case, such severe bone disease, such severe period of time, even if he's coming without much vitamin D, you start off working up for refractory. You should not wait for two months in this case because this is very, very classical. So now we are dealing with the refractory rickets with the fractures. 
but there was no any history of polyuria abdominal pain of the hematuria to ruling out distal rta kind of picture uh, due to the nephrocalcinosis there was no any pictures of the chronic renal failure like urine the decreased urine output or edema there was no hypo severe hypocalcemic features like tetany conversion there was no any uh, malabsorption syndrome like a picture like a chronic diarrhea or steatorrhea there was no another uh, syndromic association was uh, was there like night blindness photophobia or bleeding gums like lovi syndrome or uh, another entity there was no any um, um, uh, history suggesty of severe chronic uh, liver disease which is associated with it, uh, with it like a jaundice or hematemesis so uh, putting all things in our dd we left with the poor dd so our possible diagnosis could be the renal tubular acidosis malabsorption syndrome chronic renal disease hypophosphatemic rickets or vddr Yes. Sir, uh, present. Yes. As the refractory records, I put this uh, diagnosis. Yeah, so, but it, based upon your finding, that becomes very very yeah. high. Mm. Definitely CKD yes. Uh, RDA very much important. Malabsorption also, but it is very severe. Mm. Sort of a bone disease which is there. For this level of bone disease, if it is because of VDDR, hypocalcemia would be would be more severe. Disease. Yes. That also will be. Less likely. So we mainly dealing with a renal disorder. Tubular versus glomerular is the second question which will come up. So as it was nicely discussed, VDDR, hypophosphatemic rickets, chronic renal, renal disease and malabsorption syndrome was less likely in this case because there was no history suggestive of. So our main diagnosis was the renal tubular acidosis. So now otherwise in anthropometry, child have a child was severe failure to thrive, height and weight was minus uh, less than minus 3 SD and BMI was also severely low. Uh, on the um, uh, general examination, BP was normal the respiratory rate was normal which is showing that uh, the, the child has no any acidotic breathing at that moment and uh, smr was pre pivotal and uh, pulse rate was normal showing there was no any dehydration in this patient uh, birth history family history and developmental history was normal there was no any significant history on the maternal side so uh, uh, in this slide, we are clearly seeing that this, this child has a typical features of the rickets like rickettsial rosary, widening of wrist, but there was no alopecia, cataract, dental ab abnormal, uh, abnormality, or was no uh, any chronic systemic illness like a paler uh, icterus or clubbing to link out malabsorption syndrome and um, VDDR2 or hypophosphatemic rickets. So in the summary, we have eight year old boy who presented with a non consecutive marriage with the main complaint of not gaining of weight and height since two to three years, uh, who presented with the bony deformity and taking treatment for, for the vitamin D deficiency for two years. Uh, so it is showing up refractory rickets and uh, presented with the pathological fracture. So uh, as we have discussed the pi DD of the refractory rickets, our possible diagnosis at that moment was renal tubular acidosis. Now question is that is it a renal, um, distal RTA or proximal RTA? So uh, if we see the investigation, then there was a severe hypo, uh, there was a normal calcium, non normal to low level of calcium, 8.4, phosphorus was low and uh, ALP level was severely high. So if ALP level is severely high, like uh, 1,300, then it is pointing towards the distal RT rather than the proximal RT, or sorry, proximal RT rather than the distal RT. And there was a normal PTH level. Here, serum potassium level was uh, 3.4, which is a normal to lower level. STPT was normal. So again, uh, if we combine these all parameters, then uh, distal RT was the less, um, uh, 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 it goes into the bottom because the potassium level was normal at the initial level. So the very, very important investigation, which was basically overlooked, was the urinary glucose. Hmm. So he had a positive urinary yes, glucose, sir. and that really gave us a diagnosis right at that point of time. That there is glucose urea, this has to be a proximal line. Yes. So I think even other investigations can give you a clue, but yes, absolutely, and you are very right, it that's low level of phosphorus normal level of potassium and uh, all those features it is the history of a proximal RT. and if you look at the blood gas now 
and blood glaze a uh, blood gas was showing ph is 7.31 which is showing mild acidosis not a severe so in the uh, distal artery acidosis would be the severe because proximal artery is self resolving condition so acidosis will be less here bicarbonate level is uh, 16 and uh, the base excess is also minus 9.1. Bicarbonate level of the 16 is also indicating towards the proximal RTA. So now uh, to answering my previous question that it is the proximal RTA or the distal RTA. So here the twisting point, ha point has came. The urinary pH that we take into the definition the bed, which was alkaline. So here it was the picture of the distal RTA, but the other parameter was suggestive of it is a proximal RTA. But as Sir was Sir has nicely just just told that urinary glucose is an important important investigation. Here patient has a glycosuria, albumin was excreting from the urine, and there was a urinary calcium was high. Although urinary calcium uh, uh, level would be high in both type of the RTA, but there was no nephrocalcinosis. It was pointing towards the more towards the distal RTA. So if I putting uh, my diagnosis, there all features was pointing towards the proximal RTA except the uh, urinary pH, which was showing alkaline urine. Other than the for the distal RTA, um, the uh, uh, the age of uh, the urinary uh, severe osteopenia records no uh, osteo uh, uh, no no nephrocalcinosis or generalized proximal tubular dysfunction was against distal RTA. So uh, it is a proximal RTA. Now according to the, uh, some case report. Urinary pH may be invariably normal um, in case of the proximal RTA. If we have no acidosis or mild acidosis, then urinary pH can be the alkaline. So this is... Ammonium chloride loading test to actually make them more acidic and then change the urine. So as we talk about the diabetes inhibitor, we say that you need to have a concentrated blood and then you will talk about the urinary osteolysis. Similarly, if you have not enough acidosis, urinary pH should be of limited value. That is an important thing to remember. And that's why proximal RTA is very, very difficult to diagnose. All the clinical features are there, but biochemical features may be variable in that sense. So here important message is, uh, message is, is uh, if urinary pH is uh, acidic, then it is more specific or uh, sensitive towards the proximal RTA. If it is alkaline, then it could be the proximal as well as the distal RTA. Uh, so, uh, in the, for the management of this child, we have we have given the phosphor, uh, phosphorus supplement as phosphorus was severely low. We have started with the 40 milligram per kg per day. Bicarbonate was not severely low. So, we have because 16 bicarbonate was there. So, we have started with the lower dose. Two mil, my, uh, but the interesting thing is that even though the bicarb is not very low, as soon as you give bicarb, the bicarb goes up, you start losing the bicarb. Hmm. So that is the problem. Just as we talked about hypophosphatemic ringlets, you give phosphorus, you start losing more phosphorus. So it is going to be very, very difficult to build up the yeah, bicarb. While for distal RTA, once you correct the initial deficit, it's easy to correct. So this is a so it's not very severe, but the treatment, but treatment is, is a very severe. Yeah. There the treatment is easy, but initial severity is much more. Yes. So, uh, what will you worry about once you start bicarbonate here? Sir, as we start the bicarbonate, we have, we have to worry about the hypokalemia because uh, increase the sodium delivery in the distal tube will cause the hypokalemia. So, prophylactically, sometimes we have to start with the potassium. So, uh, here bicarbonate, we started with the lower dose and the, along with the vitamin D and the calcium supplements. And as we, uh, we have discussed, the potassium was started uh, prophylactically 2 microgram kg per day. So, uh, in the follow up, um, what we have to look in the follow up for the proximal RTA, we have to look for the decreased ALP level, sodium and potassium balance because it can cause the hypokalemia. Uh, we have to look for the USD, uh, uh, USD KUB to look, 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 uh, look for the nephrocalcinosis as we are giving the vitamin D level, uh, and uh, vitamin D, and we have to look for the healing line. So, um, uh, as uh, we have discussed, there was a case of the refractory rickets with the generalized proximal tubular dysfunction. And after three months uh, or three, three to six months, we have uh, advised for the genetic investigation because of the cost issue. So, genetic uh, reports has came which was clearly showing that was uh, the proximal tubular dysfunction was associated with the syndromic form, which is uh, uh, showing that tyrosinemia type 1 uh, in the FAH uh, enzyme. 
and uh, which is the pathogenic pathogenic and likely patho uh, pathogenic uh, variant of classification here uh, i want to highlight about the tyrosinemia for the two slide uh, tyrosinemia is associated with the metabolic defect in the metabolism of tyrosine which contain the five different enzyme activity if this enzyme block is block is there then um, like a 21 uh, hydroxylase deficiency uh, the proximal product can uh, cause the damage to the liver kidney and and, and the uh, eye so if it is uh, um, and this block to conversion from the tyrosine to four uh, four hydroxyphenyl py pyruvate then it can cause the oculocutaneous type of symptoms if it is blocked uh, after that then it create the uh, symptoms like neonatal tyrosinemia and uh, uh, at the final product if it is blocked at the apa gene which is the uh, uh, fumarile acetoacetate hydroxylase then it call it create the picture like type 1 tyrosinemia which in our patient came positive uh, the block product of the succinyl acetate cause the liver and renal damage in this condition and it can cause the renal Fanconi syndrome and porphyrase crisis like a picture but in our patient uh, sgpt level was normal and uh, um, many case report and according to literature the tyrosinemia uh, the liver uh, pathology um, includes in the first two to two, two years of the uh, um, uh, age but uh, in our patient it was not included it was uh, presented mainly with the proximal tubular dysfunction so, um, uh, but uh, we have the genetic report was positive and how to make the diagnosis of the tyrosinemia. Uh, we can uh, advise the tyrosine level, succinyl, aceto, uh, succinyl acetone level, enzyme level or genetic diagnosis. More higher uh, sensitive and specific diagnosis would be made by the urinary succinyl acetoacetate level or the genetic diagnosis. So, uh, if, uh, my answering to previous question, why this uh, in this patient, the liver was not that much affected. So, some case report was uh, suggestive, uh, suggestive of that. Uh, in some case, urinary uh, uh, liver synthetic function is more affected than the sgpt level so we have we have not uh, urinary uh, liver synthetic uh, uh, reports at the at this moment so uh, in follow up it, it could be the affected or it could be the cause of the severe liver damage also the sgpt level may not be very high hmm. so sgpt is a marker of cell test hmm. if already you have got a lot of damage which is there earlier it may not be reflected so we have to look from liver now from a more Classical perspective, maybe look at a ultrasound carefully, look for portal hypertension features, look for prothrombin time, and other markers which will give us whether this is a chronic liver disease now. So that will be important. Uh, but child have no hypertension omega yeah. So uh, mm. Uh, so, uh, and the, what are the management for the tyrosinemia? Uh, the ultimate uh, man management is the, is the liver transplant. But after the medicine of the MTBC, nitisinone, uh, the management has changed. It, it has a um, uh, dramatic uh, improvement in the uh, patient with the tyrosinemia. So, we can introduce, but it, it is a highly cost effective medicine. And uh, along with, we have to start with the, um, uh, the low tyrosine diet, which is a low protein diet in this patient. So, uh, by that, the, the liver uh, damage we can prevent in this perspective. Okay. So, I think that again was a very interesting case, highlighting the importance of genetic evaluation because we have not just reached that this is proximal RTA, we have reached that what is the final cause. And that is very important because of other implications which were there in this case. So, I think uh, we will uh, just touch base about proximal RTA, what we discussed is that whenever we treat proximal RTA, we might need to give a higher dose of uh, alkali and this will cause greater distal delivery and this distal delivery will activate the sodium absorption and potassium exchange so when you treat there is a risk of hypokalemia so in distal rta there is hypokalemia from beginning which improves with alkali therapy in proximal rta you have normal potassium which may worsen with alkali therapy so you have to be cautious as uh, manoj had already clearly said you also have to give other parameters and thiazide also sometimes are used in terms of managing. So now we have the final case. We have talked about VDDR, we talked about hypophosphatemic, proximal RTA, and now we are talking about a very interesting case of distal RTA. Dr. Dhwani, please. So good afternoon, everybody. Thank you, sir. Moving on to our final case. Uh, we had with us Ms. B, who presented to us at 12 years of age 
with uh, complaints of poor weight and height gain, recurrent fractures and polyuria from an early childhood, about six to eight years of age. With this, the mother gave complaint of anorexia, nausea, intermittent nausea, and a, like a poor health in general. Um, for these complaints, they had shown to multiple doctors received on and off treatment for uh, a number of years before they presented to us. Development-wise, she was otherwise normal, had mild gross motor delay, which had improved with age. Antenatal and perinatal history was uh, insignificant. There was no history of similar uh, complaints in the family and no sibling deaths. She was immunized for age. The parents were told that she had rickets and had received vitamin D calcium supplements for uh, on and off for over one to two years with no significant improvement as per the parents. At presentation to us at 12 years of age, uh, she was significantly stunted, underweight and uh, wasted. She had mild tachypnea, tachycardia with an acidotic pattern of breathing. Head to toe examination showed no obvious dysmorphism, no obvious hearing and vision abnormalities. However, we could appreciate widened risks and genovirus. So, if now look at a later onset of presentation with such severe failure of the type, yes. if we go one by one, can it be VDTR? Uh, no, we would expect a younger age of presentation. And with hypocalcemia, could it be hypocalcemia with crickets? Um, Yes, but again, it's a girl child. We do not expect it to be so severe. And and we would the height have... is very, very short. Yes. And we have got uh, significant bone pathology. Yes. Now, proximal versus distal? Uh, proximal versus distal. So, yes, again, as we have seen in the previous one, proximal would present earlier. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, they, will, they might have cataracts. They might have other uh, associated abnormalities. So, if we just look at all these cases that we discussed today, the first case classically had a later onset presentation with lower than classically to hypocalcemic case. Dr. Yating's and Dr. Musa's case was earlier onset with hypocalcemia, yeah. going more in favor of VDTR. The third case was also earlier onset with significant failure to price suggesting of proximal RTA. Yeah. And this is a slightly lower case with much more effect now. Which is suggest you a weight of minus 8.9 SDS. Yes. It's a huge blow in terms of growth. So this goes into dysphagia. So if you just look at the clinical parameters, you can make a diagnosis in most cases. Yes. SMI was pre-puberty at 12 years of age. So it suggests that a chronic process has been had been going on that was unaddressed in this child. Systemic examination was grossly normal. So in our database, we have a 12-year-old girl born of non-consignment conception with normal antenatal and perinatal period with failure to thrive, polyuria and pathological fracture, on examination being wasted and stunted with acidotic breathing and features of rickets. So if we look at it, if we look at the uh, three major things, failure to thrive, polyuria and features of rickets, uh, we can think of chronic malnutrition, we, uh, which can explain the failure to thrive and rickets. However, it cannot really explain the polyuria. Moreover, chronic malnutrition will be associated with other micronutrient deficiencies with uh, protein uh, deficiency, but she had no features of hyperproteinemia. She had no features suggestive of any other micronutrient deficiency. Type 1 diabetes, again, can explain the failure to thrive in polyuria, but for a child 12 years old who has been symptomatic since about 6 to 8 years of age, not having landed up in DK so far, not... Um, is less likely to be type 1. So, of course, type 1 will be. Yeah. Yeah. And it will not explain the rickets. DI again um, will not explain rickets in this stage. Uh, conditions of uh, fat malabsorption again won't be. So, can this disease cause polyuria? Yes, long standing, yes. Hypokalemia. So, hypokalemia can cause nephrogenic yes, but I think that could be a theoretical possibility here. But if you look at the bone picture, it is too characteristically very severe in this case. So the points that remain here, uh, especially knowing that she had an acidotic pattern of breathing, are RT and CKD. Now, the, as we've already seen the algorithm, the thing that will immediately help us distinguish between the two is the serum creatinine level. So let us have a look at the investigations. Uh, okay, so in a child with rickets, if the child responds to the uh, conventional therapy, we are looking at a deficiency ricket. If the child is not responsive to the conventional therapy, then one needs to look at the phosphorus levels. If the phosphorus is low, we look at the blood gas. In presence of acidosis, we are looking at RTA. If the blood gas is normal, look at the calcium and PTH levels, normal in hypophosphatemic rickets. And we have already seen. So again, 
The only thing I'm concerned about right now is the creatinine. So if the creatinine is high, I know I'm looking at CKD. If the creatinine is normal, I know I'm looking at RTA. Uh, again, uh, if we look at the blood gas, a normal, a high in iron metabolic acidosis will tell us about, uh, you know, ketoacidosis, lactic acidosis, organic acidemia. But a normal and in presence of normal and iron gap metabolic acidosis, if the urine and iron gap is positive, look at potassium. High potassium will suggest type 4 uh, hyperkalemic RTA and a normal or low, in presence of normal or low potassium, look at urine pH. If it is low, then we're looking at proximal, and if it is high, we're looking at distal RTA. So uh, these are the investigations of the index case at first presentation. So hemoglobin is normal. So we definitely creatinine was normal, hemoglobin was normal. So this pretty much rules out CKD in this child. Uh, she had borderline low potassium level. Um, blood gas and anion gap showed normal anion gap metabolic acidosis. Urine routine was normal. So there was no uh, glycosuria, no amino acids. And the severity of acidosis was much more compared to what one only presented. Yes. So this yes. is classically yes. Catch point here again is the urine pH of 5.8 uh, with a high calcium, uh, urine calcium creatinine ratio and an ultrasound KUB showing metrocalcin of it. X ray risks, which were widened on examination, showed cupping, pain, and sleep. And there were also some pathological factors also. Yes. So, um, so looking at the uh, differentiating points between uh, the different RTAs, we know that the primary defect in distal RTA is a defect in acidification of urine. So you cannot lose uh, the uh, proton in urine. Proximal RTA, whereas the defect is reabsorption, so you're losing a lot of bicarbonate in urine. These usually present with polyuria, polydipsia, uh, and muscle weakness with failure to thrive. Catch point here again is nephrolithiasis or nephrocalcinosis, which will be seen in distal RTA. The urine pH will be higher compared to the other two variants. And serum bicarb, as you have seen in the index case, it was around 11, whereas in the proximal RTA case that we saw previously, the serum bicarb was around 16. Um, so this brings us to the uh, diagnosis of distal RTA in our index case. Uh, looking at the treatment options, we see that the uh, Bicarb therapy advice here is one to two millimoles per kg per day, whereas in the proximal RTA, it is about 10 to 15 millimoles. So when you're losing bicarb, you will have to supplement more bicarb to correct the deficit and to supplement what is needed for the body. So our final diagnosis here is the RTA in presence of normal and anger of metabolic acidosis, borderline hyperkalemia and hypercalcemia with nephrocalcinosis. Treatment, the goals of treatment are to uh, correct metabolic acidosis and to prevent nephrocalcinosis if it has not settled and if it has, then to uh, prevent it from progressing further to CKD. The management includes alkali therapy, um, hypercalciuria and hypokalemia resolved with adequate acidosis correction. Potassium needs to be supplemented, especially in the initial part. Because uh, as we know that the child, these children will have uh, hypokalemia despite uh, metabolic acidosis. So they have lost their intracellular stores to come to maintain uh, an easier level. Thiazides may be required in children with persistent hypercalcinuria to uh, prevent progression of nephrocalcinosis. A newer therapy that is coming up is ADV7103, uh, which is a uh, Prolonged acting granular formulation of potassium citrate and potassium bicarbonate, which uh, has found to be, uh, which is which requires only twice daily dosing as compared to the previous thrice uh, daily dosing. It is found to have lesser GI side effect and therefore better uh, compliance to therapy and a better metabolic profile in uh, two year follow up study so far. Last but not the least, one must screen all children with distal RTA for SNHL, which is often irreversible and requires cochlear transplant. Again, another thing that I would like to highlight is because this was a near adolescent girl presenting with features of distal RTA, uh, had it not been such a long duration thing, and if we had features suggestive of a rash or an SME like symptoms, one will have to look, uh, look for features of secondary. Yeah, that's very important be. because autoimmune association we have taken of jogrins and so look for the eye, look for the uh, oral mucosa that becomes important and ANA of course is required as a basal workup but this looks more like a congenital one yeah. as form of the body.
So I think this was again a wonderful presentation. Uh, so distal RTA, basically the problem is that you are not able to excrete the, the proton and you are able to, uh, there is a back diffusion there. So what you need to do is that you need to give a lower dose of soda bicarbonate. And as you improve that, the intracellular acidosis improves. And because of which, the potassium excretion goes down. So while your hypokalemia is there, it will actually improve with treatment. This is what we discussed subsequently as well. So this was a very interesting case in which we discussed about four interesting scenarios of VDDR, hypophosphatemic rickets, proximal and distal RTA. We'll take a few questions which are there. Uh, you can all go and have a look at our website, our courses which are available and the mobile application. So before we end, we will take a few questions uh, which are there. And uh, so Dr. Linda is asking the children with lower limb deformity have problem with their phosphorus. So that means uh, phosphopenic rickets. Uh, it, you cannot generalize Dr. Linda like that. We expect that hypophosphatemic rickets will have a later onset and lower presentation. And uh, uh, this basically is that if you have predominant lower limb abnormalities, in this case, you have to worry about a possibility of phosphopenic rickets if there's no other problems. Uh, Dr. Cyan is asking any specific cause of dental abscesses in hypophosphatemic rickets. There are some local issues predominantly from the dental aspects and people talk about this happening even without uh, and even with treatment with borosumab, they tend to continue. So it's not just a direct phosphorus related cause. There is some other issue which is working on that. So patients with borosumab may have improvement in rickets, but their dental problems may persist, which means that it's beyond phosphorus. There is some other effect of phosphatonin, which is playing a role, Dr. Sian, there. Dr. Linda is asking, when does one test for 125 dihydroxylase? So calcitriol level, we should keep it only at a very late stage. If we look at our algorithm, we say you start off with phosphorus. If your phosphorus is low or normal, do a blood gas. If your blood gas is normal, do a calcium and PTH. If both are, if you have hypocalcemia with hyperparathyroidism, only in that case, you may do a calcitriol to identify difference between VDDR1 and 2. Dr. Tania is asking from Bangladesh, long-standing distal RTA present with generalized proximal tubular dysfunction. Yes. We have many cases and that's because of a secondary hyperparathyroidism. Your hyperparathyroidism will cause a Fancari-like picture. So this, in fact, this case or maybe a severe case like this already had amino acid urea. So if you remember the, the, the chart I presented, four cases of distal RTA actually had amino acid urea. That is because of secondary hyperparathyroidism. So what I'm trying to say is that main aim is to look towards a diagnosis. Your diagnosis may not be established on the first day. Often you may have confusion, like we were treating him like VDDR2 initially, but he responded very well. So the main aim is for clinical improvement. So if you keep on thinking of diagnosis and don't give a proper treatment, there's no point. Similarly, proximal versus distal, the issue may be settled later on, but you have to give bicarbonate properly and then you assess from there. So yes, distal RTA can cause a proximal RTA-like picture. So I think this was a very exhaustive discussion. And uh, so if there are any other questions from Dr. Candy, is there a role of surgical correction? Yes, if it is persistent deformity, particularly in hypophosphatemic rickets, there is a role, but you need to have a normal metabolic profile before you do that. There are options of uh, arthropexy as well, in which you just staple the epiphysis. That can also be done or osteotomy if it's a later manifestation. So I think we've discussed a lot about rickets. I like to... Thank Dr. Yating. I think she's still there. So Dr. Yating, maybe a few words from you. Uh, Dr. Yating, uh, yeah. Your case was very interesting. Yeah. Thank you. And uh, um, no, I have no other opinions. Okay. Right Thank now. you. Thank Thanks you. a lot. So it was a nice discussion. And uh, we will be posting all the videos individually on the YouTube as well as the website. And uh, we will have the next grand round next month on